Mary Bedinger Mitchell writes, September 1862 was in the skies of the Almanac, but August still rained in hours. It was hot and dusty. The railroads in the Shenandoah Valley had been torn up, the bridges had been destroyed, communication had been made difficult, and Shepherdstown, cornered by the bend of the Potomac, lay as if forgotten in the bottom of somebody's pocket. We were without news or knowledge, except when some chance traveler would repeat the last wild and uncertain rumor that he had heard. We had passed an exciting summer. Winchester had changed hands more than once. We had been in the Confederacy and out of it again, and now we're waiting. In an exasperating state of ignorance and suspense for the next move in the great game. It was a saying with us that Shepherdstown was just nine miles from everywhere. It was, in fact, about that distance from Martinsburg and Harper's Ferry, oft mentioned names, and from Williamsport, where the armies so often crossed both to and from Maryland. It was off the direct road between those places and lay, as I said, at the foot of a great sweep in the river, and five miles from the nearest station on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. As no trains were running now, this was of little consequence. What was more important was that a turnpike road unusually fine for that region of stiff red clay, led in almost a straight line for 30 miles to Winchester on the south and stretched northward beyond the Potomac, 20 miles to Hagerstown. Two years later, it was the scene of Sheridan's ride. Before the days of steam, this had been part of the old posting road between the valley towns in Pennsylvania, and we had boasted a very substantial bridge. This had been burned down early in the war, and only the massive stone piers remained, but a mile and a half down the Potomac was the ford, and the road that lay to it lay partly above and partly along the face of rocky cliffs. It was a narrow and stony, and especially in one place around the foot of Mount Misery, it was very steep and difficult for vehicles. It was, moreover, entirely commanded by the hills on the Maryland side, but it was the ford over which some of the Confederate Army passed every year, and in 1863 was used by the main body of infantry on the way to Gettysburg. Beyond the river were the Cumberland Canal and its willow-fringed towpath from which rose the soft and rounded outlines of the hills that from their farther slopes looked down upon the battlefield of Antietam. On clear days, we could see the fort at Harper's Ferry without a glass and the flag flying over it, a mere speck against the sky, and we could hear the gun that was fired every evening at sunset. Now, Shepherdstown's only access to the river was through a narrow gorge, the bed of a small tributary of the Potomac that was made to do much duty as it slipped cheerily over its rocks and furnished power for several mills and factories, uh, most of them at that time silent. Here were also three or four stone warehouses huge empty structures testifying mutely that the town had once had a business. The road to the bridge led through this cleft down an indescribably steep street skirting the stream's ravine to whose sides the mills and factories clung in the most extraordinary fashion. In this odd little borough, then, we were waiting for developments, hearing first that 
our men were coming and then that they were not coming, when suddenly, on Saturday the 13th of September, early in the morning, we found ourselves surrounded by a hungry horde of lean and dusty tatterdemalions who seemed to rise from the ground at our feet. I did not know where they came from or to whose command they belonged, but I've since been informed that General Jackson recrossed into Virginia at Williamsport and hastened to Harper's Ferry by the shortest roads. These would take him some four miles south of us, and our haggard apparitions were perhaps a part of his force. They were stragglers at all events, professional, some of them, but some worn out by the incessant strain of that summer. When I say that they were hungry, I convey no impression of the gaunt starvation that looked from their cavernous eyes. All day, they crowded to the doors of our houses with always the same drawling complaint. I've been marching and fighting for six weeks steady, and I ain't had nothing to eat except green apples and green corn, and I wish you'd please give me a bite to eat. Their looks bore out their statements, and when they told us they had clean gin out, we believe them, and we went to get what we had. They could be seen afterward asleep in every fence corner and under every tree. But after a night's rest, they pulled themselves together somehow and disappeared as suddenly as they had come. Possibly they went back to their commands. Possibly they only moved on to repeat the same tale elsewhere. I know nothing of numbers know what force was or was not engaged in any battle. But I saw the troops march past us every summer for four years, and I know something of the appearance of a marching army, both Union and Southern. There are always stragglers, of course, but never before or after did I see anything comparable to the demoralized state of the Confederates at this time. Never were want and exhaustion more visibly put before my eyes, and that they could march or fight at all seemed incredible. As I remember, the next morning it was Sunday, September 14th, we were awakened by heavy firing at two points on the mountains. We were expecting the bombardment of Harper's Ferry and knew that Jackson was before it. Many of our friends were with him, and our interest there was so intense that we sat watching the bellowing and smoking heights for a long time before we became aware that the same phenomena were to be noticed in the north. From our windows, both points could be observed, and we could not tell which to watch more keenly. We knew almost nothing except that there was fighting, that it must be very heavy, and that our friends were surely in it somewhere. But whether at South Mountain or Harper's Ferry, we had no means of discovering. I remember how the day wore on, how we stayed at the windows, until we could not endure the suspense, how we walked about and came back to them, and how finally, when night fell, it seemed cruel and preposterous to go to bed, still ignorant of the result. Nettie Lee writes, On September 14, 1862, our young cousins, Henry and Charles Butler, surprised us by walking into their mother's house in Shepherdstown. They told us their battery in Jackson's command was near Carneysville en route to Harper's Ferry. They had come ahead on foot just to see us all and then cut across to Duffield's to rejoin the battery. So Pink, 
Harry and I got into the buggy and took in it all it could hold to see our friends as they passed the Ridge Road to Harper's Ferry. <laughs> Jackson's foot cavalry was in a real trot as they passed, and we waved our hands and they theirs, for firing at Harper's Ferry had already begun. None of us dreamed what it was all about, for we knew that two days before, our army had crossed the Potomac at Williamsport. Our cook rushed into the house. She had seen wagons coming up the hill full of wounded men, and measuring to her shoulder on her outstretched arm, she said, the blood was running out of them that deep. This horrible picture sent us flying to town. We found the foremost wagons of what seemed an endless line, discharging their piteous burdens. Mary Perrin found one of the first seriously wounded men to come to their hospital was her dear cousin, William, the father of a little girl and a young doctor himself in Barbersville, Virginia. He tried to help close a break in the Confederate line at what was to be called Bloody Lane. William died. Men ran for keys and opened the shops long empty. Other people got brooms and stirred up the dust of ages. Then swarms of children began to appear with bundles of hay and straw, taken from anybody's stable. We worked right on the street and sidewalk to comfort the men as hospitals were created. Our women set bravely to work and washed away the blood or staunched it as well as they could. Where the jolting of the long, rough ride had disarranged the hasty binding done upon the battlefield. But what did they know of wounds beyond a cut finger or a boil? One girl who had been working very hard helping men on the sidewalk moved with the wounded into the closed, hot room of a home telling me that the sights and smells so overcame her that she could only stagger to the staircase where she hung, half-conscious, over the banister, saying to herself, Oh, I hope if I faint, someone will kick me into a corner and let me lie there. Homes began filling up with wounded, as did the Christ Reformed Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, and St. Peter's Lutheran Church where the wounded bled and died in the wooden pews. Dr. Quigley's home soon had 34 wounded, and his children, Julia, John, and Mary Josephine, helped. Country neighbors came pouring in to help. Farmers' wives had been thoughtful enough to bring supplies of linen and some bread and fruit. Our wants became better known. But when all was done, it was not enough. As over 1,000 wounded soldiers were already in town, Reverend C.W. Andrews decided the doctors and residents needed Trinity Episcopal Church to rest and pray in peace. Soon, the church was the only building in town left without wounded. Yellow makeshift flags denoting a hospital flew from housetops everywhere. The water from the reliable Grant's pump on German Street began to look muddy as men all day long crowded around it, thirsting, nearly faint with exhaustion. Elijah Rickard, the locksmith who made the lock that locked the pump, watched with concern. The number of wounded would triple within 30 hours. Cannonading began over the Potomac, and once in a while, a shell came over on our side. Then we heard that some wounded were being brought into Shepherdstown, several into the old Schneively house, and some into the parents. I rushed into town, and as I entered the door of the former mansion, I saw my first wounded man, with two soldiers supporting him as the surgeon probed for a ball in his wrist. He asked for water. I ran to get some, and then fanned him while the cutting and probing continued. 
No anesthetic relieved his pain. No cry escaped his lips, save once in a while a long breath and an ouch. At last, the ball was cut out. He never flinched or fainted. But alas, I almost did and opened the door for air. Soon, every room was filled with the wounded. I went next to a Mississippian with a hole in his cheek. A ball had passed through and loosened all his beautiful white teeth, touching the palate. He told me that with his fingers he had straightened his teeth and hoped they would grow tight. He spoke with difficulty. I took a wet cloth and tied it under his chin to support it. He had large, bright black eyes and brown whiskers. He seemed wonderfully hopeful. Nettie Lee continues... As he was expecting the surgeon, and it was time for me to go home to my dinner, I left promising to bring him some nice ripe grapes, which it was hoped he could swallow. After asking my name, he put his hand in his pocket, and pulling out a lovely little gold face watch, said to me, Miss Lee, will you be kind enough to take my watch home and keep it for me? I hope I will be able to move on and not fall into the hands of the enemy or become unconscious. This watch is an heirloom and I value it. It's not safe with me here now. She writes, I took the watch home with me to Bedford, but after consultation it was agreed that I had better take it back to him as no one could tell at what moment he might be removed farther south into the Confederate lines. I returned with a basket of grapes and sat beside him. I squeezed grapes into his open mouth as long as he wanted them. He said they were the only things he could swallow without pain. And I made him take the watch. Mary Bettinger Mitchell continues. We worked far into the night that Monday, went to bed late, and rose early next morning. Tuesday brought fresh wagon loads of wounded, and would have brought despair except that they were accompanied by an apology for a commissariat. Soon, more reliable sources of supply were organized among our country friends. Some doctors also arrived who were, with a few honorable exceptions, might as well have stayed away. The remembrance of that worthless body of officials stirs me to wrath. Two or three were conscientiously and hard, and they did all the medical work except what was done by our own town physicians. In strong contrast was the conduct of the common men detailed as nurses. They were as gentle as they knew how to be, and very obliging and untiring. Of course they were uncouth and often rough, but with the wounded dying about us every day, and with the necessity that we were under for the first few days, of removing those who died at once that others not quite yet dead might take their places. There was no time to be fastidious. It required all our efforts to be simply decent and sometimes failed in that. We fed our men as well as we could from every available source and often had some difficulty feeding ourselves. The townspeople were very hospitable, and we were invited here and there, but could not always go or hesitated, knowing every house was full. I remember once that having breakfasted upon a single roll, and having worked hard among sickening details, about four o'clock 
I turned wolfishly ravenous and ran to a friend's house down the street. When I got there, I was almost too faint to speak, but my friend looked at me and disappeared in silence, coming back in a moment with a plate of hot soup. What luxury! I sat down then and there on the front doorstep and devoured the soup as if I had been without food for a week. It was known on Tuesday that Harper's Ferry had been taken by the Confederates, but it was growing evident that South Mountain had not been a victory. We had heard from some of our friends, but not from all, and what we did hear was often most unsatisfactory and tantalizing. For instance, We would be told that someone whom we loved had been seen standing with his battery, had left his gun an instant to shake hands and send a message, and had then stepped back to position while our civilian informant had come away for safety. (laughs) And the smoke of conflict had hidden battery from all view. As night drew nearer, Whispers of a great battle to be fought the next day grew louder. And we shuddered at the prospect, for battles had come to mean to us, as they never had before, blood, wounds, and death. Mary Bettinger Mitchell continues. On the 17th of September, cloudy skies looked down upon the two armies facing each other on the fields of Maryland. It seems to me now that the roar of that day began with the light, and all through its long and dragging hours, its thunder formed a background to our pain and terror. If we had been in doubt as to our friend's whereabouts on Sunday, there was no room for doubt now. There was no sitting at the windows now and counting discharges of guns or watching the curling smoke. There were noise, confusion, dust, throngs of stragglers like these, horsemen galloping about, teamsters swearing, wagons rumbling, in the midst of which men were dying, fresh wounded arriving, surgeons amputating limbs and dressing wounds, women going in and out with bandages, lint, medicines, and food. An ever-present sense of anguish, dread, pity, and I fear hatred. These are my recollections of Antietam. Mary Bettinger Mitchell continues. We went about our work with pale faces and trembling hands, yet trying to appear composed for the sake of our patients who were much excited We could hear the incessant explosions of artillery, the shrieking whistles of the shells, and the sharper, deadlier, more thrilling roll of musketry, while every now and then the echo of some charging cheer would come, borne by the wind, as the human voice pierced that demoniacal clangor. We would catch our breath and listen, and try not to sob, and turn back to the forlorn hospitals, to the suffering at our feet, 
and before our eyes, while imagination fainted at the thought of those other scenes hidden from us beyond the Potomac. As the sun began to set, the chaos of moans and efforts to care for the suffering continued. At last, Elijah Rickard stepped in, and among the soldiers that towered above him lowered the pump handle they all grabbed for and locked it tight to the pump. A roar of anger and frustration came upon him. The soldiers almost mutinied, but his firmness and the courage that housed within his frail elderly frame so impressed them that their frustration broke into cheers. After all, water had to be saved. When night came, we could still hear the sullen guns and hoarse, indefinite murmurs that succeeded the day's turmoil. We sat in silence looking into each other's tired faces. There were no impatient words, few tears, only silence and a drawing close together as if for comfort. We were almost hopeless, yet clung with desperation to the thought that we were hoping. But in our hearts we could not believe that anything human could have escaped from that appalling fire. Across the river, innumerable campfires were blazing, and we could but too well imagine the scenes that they were lighting. That night, after the battle, was a fearful one. Not a soldier, I venture to say, slept half an hour. It was a dreadful scene, a veritable field of blood. The dead and dying lay as thick as harvest sheaves, The pitiable cries for water and appeals for help were much more horrible to listen to than the deadliest sounds of battle. Silent were the dead and motionless. But here and there were raised stiffened arms. Heads made a last effort to raise themselves from the ground. Prayers were mingled with oaths and oaths of delirium. And the men wriggled over the earth. Midnight withheld all distinction between the blue and the gray. My horse trembled under me in terror, looking down at the ground, sniffing the scene of blood, stepping falteringly as a horse will over or by the side of human flesh. Afraid to stand still, hesitating to go on, his animal instinct shuddering at this cruel human mystery. Once his foot slid into a little shallow filled with blood and spurted a little stream on his legs and my boots. I had surfeit of blood that day and I couldn't stand this. I dismounted. General Jackson had said he would have me relieved in a few hours. But the garish sun had risen and was throwing its merciless searchlight on the debris of that ghastly battlefield when he made his appearance in person and took a careful, critical view of all the surroundings. Mary Bedinger Mitchell wrote, On Thursday... The two armies lay idly facing each other, but we could not be idle. The wounded continued to arrive until the town was quite unable to hold all the disabled in suffering. They filled every building and overflowed into the country round, into farmhouses, barns, corn cribs, cabins, wherever four walls and a roof were found together. Those able to travel were sent on to Winchester and other towns back from the river, but their departure seemed to make no appreciable difference. There were six churches, and they were all full. The Odd Fellows Hall, the Freemasons, the little town council room, 
the barn-like place known as the drill room, all the private houses after their capacity, the shops and empty buildings, the schoolhouses, every inch of space, and yet the cry was for more room. The unfinished town hall had stood in naked ugliness for many a long day, but somebody threw a few rough boards across the beams, placed the piles of straw over them, lay down single planks to walk upon, and lo, it was a hospital at once. The stone warehouses down in the ravine and by the river had been passed by because low and damp and undesirable sanitariums, but now their doors and windows were thrown wide, and with barely time allowed to sweep them, they were all occupied. Even the old blue factory, an antiquated, crazy, dismal building of blue stucco that peeled off in great blotches, which had been shut up for years and was in the last stages of dilapidation. A surgeon at the hospital at Hoffman's Wagon Maker's shop cut off legs and arms regardless of the feelings of the unfortunate soldiers who came under his care. There was in this place a big soldier who was suffering from the greatest pain from a ball in his foot. There were indications of gangrene. Dr. Blank, as he was called, examined the foot brusquely and told the man that the foot would have to come off. No, it won't, said the soldier. Then you'll die, said the surgeon. All right, was the soldier's reply. The surgeon swore at the man and turned away and continued to dress the wounds of others. A woman who had heard the conversation brought another surgeon from Mulder's Hall. The second doctor examined the soldier's foot and presently with quick pressure of his strong, skillful fingers, he squeezed the wound and out popped the bullet. One, who had no thought of leaving her post, desired to send her sister, a mere child, out of harm's way. She therefore told her to go to their home, about half a mile distant, and ask their mother for some yellow cloth that was in the house, thinking, of course, that the mother would never permit the girl to come back into the town. But she miscalculated. The child accepted the commission as a sacred trust, forced her way out over the crowded road where the danger was more real than in the town itself, reached home and made her request. The house had its own flag flying, for it was directly in range and full of wounded. Perhaps for this reason, the mother was less anxious to keep her daughter with her. Perhaps in the hurry and excitement, she allowed herself to be persuaded that it was really necessary to get that strip of yellow flannel into Shepherdstown as soon as possible. At all events, she made no difficulty, but with streaming tears, kissed the girl and saw her set out to go alone half a mile through a panic-stricken rabble, under the fire of a battery, and into a town whose escape from conflagration was at best not assured. To come out had been comparatively easy, for she was going with the stream. The return was a different matter. The turbulent tide now had to be stemmed. Yet she managed to work her way along, now in the road, now in the field, slipping between the wagon wheels, and once at least <laughs> crawling under a stretcher. No one had noticed her coming out. She was but one of the crowd, but now most were too busy with her own safety to pay much heed to anything else. Still, as her face seemed alone set toward the town, she attracted some attention. <laughs> 
One or two spoke to her. Now it was, Look here, little gal. Don't you know you're going the wrong way? One man looked at the yellow thing she'd slung across her shoulder, and he said with an approving nod, That's right. That's right. Save the wounded if you can. And she meant to do it. And finally reached her sister, breathless but triumphant, with as proud a sense of duty done as if her feudal errand had been the deliverance of a city. Mary Bettinger Mitchell continues, I had just taken a bowl of gruel to a friend in the old blue factory, and she was walking across the floor with the bowl in her hands when a shell crashed through a corner of the wall and passed out at the opposite end of the building, shaking the rookery to its foundations, filling the room with dust and plaster, and throwing her upon her knees to the floor. The wounded screamed, and had they not been entirely unable to move, not a man would have been left in the building. But it was found that no one was hurt, and things proceeded as before. I asked her afterward if she was frightened. She said, yes. When it was over, but her chief thought at the time was to save the gruel, for the man needed it, and it had been very hard to find anyone composed enough to make it. A Mrs. Snyder visited the soldiers that filled her Presbyterian church, carrying a large kettle brimming with her potato and green bean stew. It didn't take long to feed the hungry and, and empty the kettle when she felt a tug at her skirt. She stopped to see a young fellow, scarcely 17 years old, holding to her dress. He said, Have you any more beans? She said she had not, but would cook more beans and bring them Friday morning. Will you bring me some? She said she would. Please bring me a lot of them. Mrs. Snyder's mother heart went out to this golden-haired lad. She stooped down and kissed him and held him close for a moment as tears filled her eyes and his. And then he forced a smile. And she replied she wouldn't forget to bring him a whole lot of beans. 16-year-old William L. Reinhardt crawled across Packhorse Ford, wounded in both the hand and the foot. For two long days and nights after that, he lay behind the old Boltler cement mill while a courier brought word of his whereabouts to his family farm at Mulder's Crossroads. Jacob Wintermore even remembered the man who wounded him, a man from Hagerstown named Heedwole. I found the house, father's office, and every vacant space full of soldiers. General Lawton had been badly wounded, and with his doctor and orderlies had Brother Edwin's room in the eastern wing. In the next room was young Tom Barlow with a broken leg and his brother Jack to nurse him. Jack came with tears in his eyes and asked us to care for them. They were from Williamsburg, Virginia. My uncle, Colonel Richard Henry Lee, though not wounded, was induced by father to stay with us. Then General Robert E. Lee's son, Rooney, had his horse fall on his leg and sprain it badly. He was in the little room next to General Lawton and remained a day or two. In the room next to my own was a poor fellow named Willis, who soon began to develop typhoid fever, was ill for weeks, and died there. That Thursday night, the 18th, was raining, but Dr. Quigley left his house to visit one of the men cared for by Mrs. Henrietta Bedinger Lee at Bedford. He was one of 16 wounded soldiers there. In my father's office in the yard, a soldier sat propped in an armchair, holding his arm which rested on his knee. 
There was a puddle of blood between his feet. Blood was dropping from a wound, small and not painful, but it had dropped all day. We had tried to get a surgeon to tie the artery. We feared he would die before morning. At last, Mother sent a note to dear old Dr. Quigley, our family physician. It was dark and it was raining, but he came to us with only a dim lantern to guide his footsteps. He told us he could not see to take up the artery, but thought his medicine would clot the blood and staunch it until morning. It did relieve the patient who slept quietly all night with a friend beside him. On Thursday night, we heard more than the usual sounds of disturbance and movements, and in the morning, we found the Confederate Army in full retreat. General Lee crossed the Potomac under the cover of darkness, and when the day broke, the greater part of his force had gone into Carneysville and Leetown. General McClellan began to shell the retreating army from Douglas's Hill. Ah, me. Those maimed and bleeding fugitives. When firing commenced, the hospitals began to empty. All who were able to put one foot after another or could bribe or beg comrades to carry them left in haste. In vain we implored them to stay. In vain we showed them the folly and the suicide of the attempt. In vain we cajoled, threatened, ridiculed, pointed out that we were remaining and that there was less danger here than on the road. The cannon were bellowing on Douglas's hill, the shells whistling and shrieking, the air full of shouts and cries. We had to scream to make ourselves heard. The men replied that the Yankees were crossing, that the town was about to be burned, that we could not be made prisoners, but they could, that anyhow they were going as far as they could walk or be carried. And go they did. Men with cloths about their heads went hatless in the sun. Men with cloths about their feet limped shoeless on the stony road. Men with arms in slings, without arms, with one leg, with bandaged sides and backs. Men in ambulances, carts, wheelbarrows. Men carried on stretchers or supported on the shoulders of some self-denying comrade. All who could crawl went, and went to almost certain death. Nettie Lee hurried to Schnively House to see the young soldier from Mississippi, but he had gone. The soldier at Hoffman's wagon maker shop who refused Dr. Blank's decision to amputate left with his army on a new set of handmade crutches made for him by a resident. The soldier who had been bleeding heavily from his wound at Bedford was propped up on a cavalry horse by his comrades and he too left with the army. Wounded men at the old Bedinger home left on peg legs, taken from a stairway banister. And perhaps thinking of her husband, who had been mortally wounded at Manassas, Lily Perrin Lee and her sister Annie also begged their wounded soldiers to stay, stay and heal. Mrs. Snyder arrived once again at the Presbyterian Church carrying her kettle of fresh, specially made green bean stew. Just as an attendant was placing a sheet over the young soldier, she had promised the stew. Having thought of her young friend most of the night, she was heartbroken. She turned and offered her gift of food to the living. Our hospitals did not remain empty. It was but a portion who could get off in any manner, and their places were soon taken by others who had remained near the battlefield and attempted to follow the retreat, but having reached Shepherdstown could go no farther. We had plenty to do, but all that day we went about with hearts bursting with rage and shame and breaking with pity and grief for the needless waste of life. O oh, child of my heart, how I long for quietness and rest. May God in his mercy bless you and keep you, is your devoted mother's prayer. Oh, how many desolate homes, orphan children, and widowed mothers has this vile, cruel, and oppressive war caused. <laughs> 
The Battle of Sharpsburg and Antietam ended truly on Saturday, September 20th, with a bloody, unsuccessful attempt by federal soldiers to catch the tail end of the retreating Confederate Army at Packhorse Ford. Only soldiers under Confederate General A.P. Hill turned back the attempt. Federal soldiers from Philadelphia called the Corn Exchange Regiment because they just recently joined the Army in exchange for a bonus provided by the corn brokers were trapped and killed on the hills of Shepherdstown or as they tried suicidally to recross the river. Their rifles, not yet used in war, did not work. According to an eyewitness, the slaughter was terrific. The Potomac was reddened with blood and corpses. The event signaled the true climax of General Robert E. Lee's high-stakes invasion into the North. Those few days, those few events of Old Testament enormity and scale are what the people of once sleepy Shepherdstown bore witness to. Those few days and those few events forged the purpose of the war and have been the American Chronicle ever since for the parent, the child, the meek, and the mighty alike. An estimated 5,000 wounded soldiers were cared for in Shepherdstown during and after the battles. 2,500 Confederate wounded, still on the Maryland side, were treated by federal doctors. When federal troops took control of Shepherdstown, they exchanged wounded and brought some federal wounded from Shepherdstown back to Maryland. Confederate dead were buried in Elmwood Cemetery in Shepherdstown. To Henrietta Lee, recovered soldier Tom Barlow wrote from Richmond, It was indeed with sad hearts that we parted with you all to whose kindness we owed so much. Felix Warren wrote to the ladies of Shepherdstown, May the blessings of an unseen hand upon this place attend, for they have indeed proved to us to be the soldier's friend. Fathers, mothers, sisters dear, for us count do not more, for they have eased our painful wounds whilst weltering in our gore. Mary Bettinger Mitchell writes, The country grew more composed. General Lee lay near Leetown, some seven miles south of us, and General McClellan rested quietly in Maryland. On Sunday, we were able to have some short church services for our wounded, cut still shorter, I regret to say, by reports that the Yankees were crossing. Such reports continued to harass us, especially as we feared the capture of our friends who would often ride down to see us during the day, but who seldom ventured to spend a night so near the river. We presently passed into a debatable land when we were in the Confederacy in the morning, in the Union after dinner, and on neutral ground at night. We lived through a disturbed and eventful autumn, subject to continual alarms and excursions, but when this Saturday came to an end, the most trying and tempestuous week of the war for Shepherdstown was over.
Without exaggeration, I almost pined to see that romantic little town of Shepherdstown on the banks of the Potomac, where the virgins are soft as the roses they twine, and all save the soul of man is divine. Not knowing that his beloved son had already died of wounds and typhoid, Lieutenant Colonel W.R. Willis fearfully wrote back to Henrietta Lee on October 16, 1862. I will thank you to inform us by telegraph or other means of his condition, it being possible for his mother to get to him. That winter, residents of Shepherdstown went hungry. Typhoid fever reached record levels. Yet, unlike many, the town lived on. 